Sorry? No, it's okay. Okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, the organizers. I'm very happy to be here, first time in uh, South America. Uh, so I will be talking about uh, invisit limit of Navier Stokes in a bounded domain. First part of the talk will be about Pronto, and then second part of the talk will be about invisit limit. And uh, I was lucky that uh, both uh, Elena and uh, Marco and Claude uh, gave talks about this uh, issue before, so I will uh, be fast, and I apologize if there's a lot of repetition. Um, okay, we're considering Navier Stokes, which I have written here. I will, for most of the talk, denote by gamma the trace on the boundary. So you have Dirichlet boundary conditions for Navier-Stokes, and you have uh, slip uh, boundary conditions for Euler. And we will be looking, uh, at least in the beginning, for the problem on a half space, but again, bounded domain, which has smooth boundary, will work pretty much the same. Um, the question is, of course, as the kinematic viscosity goes to zero, do solutions of Navier-Stokes convert to solutions of Euler? If yes, in what space do you have rates? And if no, what happens, right? This is the classical problem. And um, in the absence of boundaries, uh, the answer is yes. Navier-Stokes does converse to Euler, and this has been mentioned, uh, was proven by Cato and Swan before. And there, in terms of rates, uh, if you're considering vortex patches, you get the, the sharp rates, and this was shown by Konstantin and Wu. So now what happens if you do have boundaries? And uh, in general, as far as I know, the problem is open, but we have a lot of uh, sufficient conditions for the implicit limit to hold. And in particular, uh, as Elena just uh, mentioned, uh, there's the result of Cato, which shows that if uh, you multiply the dissipation rate of energy, but only in a boundary layer of width proportional to nu, and this, this goes to zero as nu goes to zero, then the inviscid limit holds. And when I say inviscid limit holds, I always mean it in L infinity in time, L2 in space. And this result was uh, improved uh, by, by many authors, in particular Timam and Wong uh, removed the need for the full tangential, uh, for the full gradient by requiring only the tangential gradient. Uh, then Wong put a condition on the tangential pressure gradient and uh, Jim uh, Kelleher proved that uh, you can replace uh, that full gradient by the vorticity matrix. And uh, there's many results in special geometries or in special physical regimes where the inviscid limit does hold. And here I would like to mention a couple. Uh, Masmoudi proved that if, um, if the viscosity in the normal direction goes to zero much faster than the viscosity in the tangential direction, then the inviscid limit holds. And then if you have special geometries such as uh, circular flows, or uh, I'm gonna repeat Helena's talk, <laughs> but uh, you have uh, many very interesting geometrical settings where the inviscid limit does hold due to the underlying geometry. And uh, if you do change the limit, you don't approach Euler by Navier-Stokes, but by, for instance, uh, alpha Euler, then again, the inviscid limit holds. And in cases where you have Navier boundary conditions instead of Dirichlet boundary conditions, again, there are instances where it is known that the visit limit holds. So now the question is um, what to do for Dirichlet boundary conditions in general. And I will be talking uh, a bit about Prandtl equations. And Prandtl's uh, formal derivation of the equation is based on the idea that, so the, the Navier-Stokes solution is zero on the boundary but the Euler one doesn't have a full, uh, only, only the tangential part is, uh, is non-zero. So you have to have a sharp transition. And because of that, dy derivative, so y is always the normal direction, x is tangential. dy derivative costs a lot. And hence, if you look at the equations, this is the term which cost, costs the most. And you say, let's make that term O of one. And because of that, it means you should look at boundary width, which has uh, size root of the viscosity. And based on this, Prandtl made the formal asymptotic expansion in this number epsilon, which is square root of the viscosity, as, uh, as we saw in Marco's talk. And uh, the idea is that this first order corrector could be described as Euler away from the boundary, not corrector, first order approximation to the Navier-Stokes flow should be described by Euler away from the boundary and by something else near the boundary and Prandtl make the answer that near the boundary, it should have this form, 
plug it in the Navier-Stokes equations, and you formally get the Prandtl equations by dropping all, all of epsilon terms. And the Prandtl equations are here. You have a heat equation, but a very important dissipation only in the normal direction. You have the full transport equation. You have the pressure gradient with the caveats that the pressure does not depend on the normal direction. So hence, it, mu it is specified by the underlying Euler pressure. And you have boundary conditions, namely at the top of the boundary layer, the Prandtl solution goes to the Euler solution, the trace of it, of course. The pressure goes to the Euler pressure. And on the bottom of the layer, which is the bottom of the wall, uh, you have zero Dirichlet boundary conditions. And in terms of the Prandtl equations, now you can start to ask questions about stability. And of course, we are all familiar with uh, pictures of flows, realistic flows, and it, where Prandtl holds, well, maybe here, probably not here. So uh, where Prandtl is valid, I think, is a very important question. And to do that, I think we, uh, one has to study the problem mathematically. So in terms of uh, stability, also known as well-posedness, uh, there's basically two types of results. One type of results goes back to Olenik, where the, the idea is that if you assume the data is monotonic in the y direction, and how does this come in? Um, remember, these equations have vorticity, always underlying vorticity. So if you look at Prandtl, dt u Prandtl, has a vorticity. And the vorticity of Prandtl is dy. Okay, this is the vorticity. And it has an equation. looks the same. <laughs> um, okay. Oh, this is omega, sorry. So Olenik's condition, for me, is very hard to understand, but uh, Masmoudi and Wong had a very, very beautiful observation. There's a very, very nice cancellation if you look at the velocity equation and the vorticity equation together. Namely, if you define this function g, to be basically the vorticity minus velocity multiplied by derivative of vorticity over vorticity. And you stare at these two terms. By the way, these are the bad terms in Prandtl. You take this equation and you subtract from it this equation multiplied by dy omega over omega. These two terms cancel. So this function g obeys a much nicer PDE than either velocity or vorticity. And based on that, Masmoudi and Wong uh, rederived uh, Olenik's results um, <coughs> using just energy methods, no Kroko transform. The other type of results that are known for Prandtl is that if the initial data is analytic, uh, and initially it was proven using analyticity in both X and Y by San Martino and Kaplisch, uh, that then you have local existence. Um, and then there was an improvement by Canone, Lombardo, and San Martino where it required only anticity in the tangential direction. And I want to emphasize this is very important because uh, shortly after this paper, uh, Wynan E uh, and Enquist proved a special type of blow up for Prandtl. That data is not analytic with respect to X and Y. So in particular, when E uh, and Enquist proved their result, the data from which they proved the blow up, it was not known that you have local existence from that data. This result of Canone, Lombardo, and San Martino proves exactly that, that if you only require tangential analyticity, then the data of E and Enquist, you do have local in-time solutions, and therefore the question of blow-up is a, is a defined question. So this is why I think this is a very important uh, observation of um, Canone, Lombardo, and San Martino. And I would just like to finish the slide by saying that the inviscid Prandtl equations are well posed in a weak sense because you can write down trajectories, characteristics. So basically the trouble comes because of the viscosity. If you kill this term, uh, the equations are weakly well posed. Now, we all know, however, that Prandtl is not a well posed system. It's ill posed if you look at uh, any Sobolev type uh, topology. And um, 
ill-posedness of the parental equations has seen a lot of progress recently by Grenier, Gerard-Varen, Dormi, Gerard-Varen and Guyen, Guon and Guyen. And uh, the idea was the following, that if you look at um, high frequency perturbations in the x direction, this term, if you look at this incompressibility, can be actually written as dx integral zero to y u parental minus times dy u parental. This term is the one which loses the x derivative. And because it loses a full x derivative, for a long time people thought that the analytic setting is sharp. Uh, Cauchy Kowalski can deal with one loss of derivatives. Uh, however, in these constructions of high frequency oscillations, basically due to Grenier and then uh, Javare and Dormi, if you linearize now around the specific shear flow, you can only get growth, so instability, which looks like this. So wave number k is this k in x. And if you stare at this, you see that this, this k, which is that k, comes with i. That does not cause growth. This causes growth, however, root k. And this is the best they could construct. It is not the theorem that this is the worst it can happen. But based on this, you can conjecture, actually, that uh, Prantel is well posed in Javray classes. And uh, recently, Javray and Masmoudi proved that it is well posed in uh, Javray seven quarters. And the close, the gap between seven quarters and two is still open, as far as I know. Okay, now, what are the relevant questions about Prantel? Number one, does Prantel describe this proper asymptotic expansion? That outside of the layer you have Euler, inside of the layer you have Prantel, and you have order epsilon perturbations? And the answer is yes, if uh, the initial data is analytic with respect to X and Y, and this was proven by San Martino and Kafler. And the answer is no, at least at the linear level, as was recently shown by Grenier, Guan, and Guyen again, at the linear level. But I want to emphasize that, again, for the second part of the talk, I will talk about the inviscid limit, not about Prantel. Just because Prantel, just because this is false, doesn't mean that the inviscid limit does not hold in L2. The direction is one direction. It's not if and only if. So these questions are definitely related, but they, they're not equivalent. Uh, so the first result I would like to mention is uh, the result with uh, Igor Kukavica. We basically... We're working in, these, uh, in this regime of San Martino and Kaflisch, and in these results you have an exponential matching at, at the top of the boundary layer with the Euler flow. And uh, in physics textbooks sometimes, um, for instance in this book of Batchelor, he writes down this quantity delta one, which should uh, measure how much Prandtl layer talks to Euler. And he writes this formula down. So if you want Prandtl to talk the most as, as, mo as much as possible to Euler, then you should allow this to decay as slow as possible as you approach the Euler flow. Capital U is the trace of the Euler flow. And uh, basically with Igor, we wanted to see whether it is possible to allow this convergence to be just one minus integrable power of Y. So algebraic power rather than exponential. So I will describe this result first. So how do you prove such a result? First of all, it's very nice to have homogeneous boundary conditions at zero and infinity. It's nice, uh, we can integrate by parts then. Uh, so you subtract the infinity piece. Of course, this changes the zero piece. But when you subtract the piece at infinity, you get this bad term, which is y times dxu. And to deal with this term, people have been uh, using exponential decay at infinity because it's very nice to deal with that term if you have exponentially decaying functions. And this is the term which prevents you to prove algebraic, uh, well postness with algebraic decay. Uh, our idea, again, this is work with uh, Igor Kavica, was that you can make a change of variables based on the Euler flow. So capital U is the trace of the Euler flow. Uh, and you have a Lagrangian map. It's, you start with the identity, and you flow the map according to a, somehow a nonlinear, a linear Burgers equation due to the underlying Euler flow. This induces a change of variables in the y direction. And once you make this change of variables, you call the new variable this, and you also homogenize the boundary condition at zero, you get a new system. The beauty of this new system, it doesn't have this y dx term anymore. It just has an elliptic parabolic piece, sorry, some nonlinear term, some linear terms which are benign, and some force which is benign. Ignore the force. Ignore the linear term. The nonlinearity is almost the same. 
But the point is that the y term has disappeared. You only have an elliptic term. Okay, it has non-constant coefficients. This a starts off as the identity, but for a short time it's bigger than a half. It's between a half and two, so this is just fine. And um, the result is that if you have algebraic decay uh, with uh, rate theta, so y to negative theta, such that you see these two numbers add up to more than one, and data which is analytic with respect to the y direction only, only Sobolev in x, then you have local, local existence. And again, for me at least, the relevance of these uh, results, I will discuss also in a moment in relation to my Kava's work. Okay, so how about the Olenic setting? We know that the data is globally monotonic, so if the vorticity has a sign globally, then you have a local in time of solution. Now how about you ask the following question. Let's say you have your domain. Here you have vorticity positive, here you have vorticity negative, for some reason. And again, this is again relevant in terms of a well positiveness theorem of the hydrostatic Euler equation. It was recently proven um, by uh, Tsao, uh, Nakanishi, Titi, and Ibrahim, that's right, that uh, the hydrostatic Euler equations are well blow up. But the type of data, it was not known before that you have local existence. So we wanted to again create a, a setting for which that data gives you local existence. And this was the motivation for this work. Okay, so in general, you will not have solutions if you start with data like that. You need something more. And the question we wanted to answer is what do you need to assume here on this line so that you have at least local existence for Pronto. And as it turns out, the answer is you should have a Taylor series here that converges. Okay, a Taylor series in Y, uh, in X, sorry, in X. That is to say that the vorticity can be negative here, can be positive here, as long as on the lines where it switches sign, it's analytic with respect to Y, on that line. So on that line, you have a germ which converges. Now, of course, how does one, uh, okay, I have a slide with the statement of the result, but I, let's not, uh, maybe not look at that. Um, let me just describe the proof in, in words, or on the board, I mean. Uh, this is joint work with uh, Igor Kavitsa, Naderma Smoody, and Tarkwork Wong. <coughs> okay. So here's the proof. Here you have vorticity positive, so if I look in a strip, the width of the strip is the anaticity radius half. Remember, I assumed anaticity on, on this line. It means I converge with a radius of convergence tau. It means if I take this tau halves, I'm actually uniformly analytic in a strip. Okay, now I'm uniformly analytic in a strip. It means that I can find a number strictly positive now that the vorticity is bounded from below away from zero because I assume the vorticity is smooth. I have Sobolev smoothness. Here, on the other hand, we have exactly the opposite. So you have strict monotonicity now on these regions. Okay. Part one of the proof. In this strip, construct a real analytic solution. So that's part one. Of course you're gonna say, how in the world are you gonna do that? Here you only have HS regularity. Here we're taking infinitely many derivatives how in the world are they going to match at the boundary? There's no way. Well, it does. koshikov alevsky allows you to solve without boundary conditions. That is the trick. So you can actually construct a solution without boundary conditions. koshikov alevsky can deal with the derivative. That's the point. Okay, step two. Now you have a function defined here. Can you construct a function here? Uh, if you look at the proof, um, 
for instance, this energy proof that I ma mentioned based on the cancellation of vorticity minus u dy vorticity over vorticity, it requires periodic boundary conditions, this proof. So in particular, it cannot deal with side boundary conditions. So what we had to do was to take this function and extend it to the whole plane, of course, by sacrificing so I extend this function to the whole plane by sacrificing half of this constant. But now I have on the whole plane a function which is uniformly monotone. How, that's not, doesn't sound good. How can it be uniformly monotone if it has to decay at infinity? That's not gonna happen. So instead what we actually do is we look at uniformly lock spaces, HS uniform lock. So you look at strips of width one, shift the strips of width one, so HS it should be U lock here. And then the bound has to be independent of where you shift your strip. Okay, you can do that. And then on each single strip, you construct a monotone solution. You do this with the negative part as well. So let's summarize. We have one analytic solution, infinitely monotone solutions which all overlap, which are positively monotone, infinitely many which are negative monotone. That's not very good. So here, let's say construct many monotone solutions. So of course you have to glue. How do you glue? Well, you glue because you can compare two monotone solutions, but the, actually the hard gluing is between analytic and monotone. The hard gluing is here. <coughs> you can take the monotone solution. Here you can do the difference between analytic and monotone. And you can write down the PDE for this quantity. So again, bar denotes the difference between the vorticity on the monotone piece and the analytic piece. You can now estimate this PDE. And the main idea is that in the X direction, you have finite speed of propagation. You only have a transport in X. So you have finite speed of propagation. The, the way in which the monotone piece influences the analytic piece is through a finite speed. It's the L infinity norm of U. So as long as I can make my radius of analyticity shrink at a speed, so this would go down with what speed? The speed given by the L infinity norm of the monotone solution. Then I can make sure it doesn't influence it instantly. And that's how we can glue solutions. So of course this construction is not unique. However, in the class that you get, and Again, that's this class, let's not discuss this. It's unique. It's all sorts of conditions about smoothness, decay. The idea is you have HS uniform lock with a sign. Where's the sign? Here. You have analytic here, that's all. Okay, so all good. Um, this theorem, okay, I described this already, uh, works for the hydrostatic Euler equations if monotonicity is replaced by convexity. And again, from my point of view, this is relevant because it gives a well positedness of the initial data of Tsao, uh, Nakanishi, Ibrahim, and Titi, from which the equation we know blows up. So now this is a very nice equation for which we know finite time blow up from data which is well posed. Okay, but still, what does this say about the inviscid limit? This picture, well, not clear. So let's return to the inviscid limit. And the motivating question that we wanted to address with Peter and Igor was the following. Assume Prandtl is well posed in some topology given by some space X, some strong space maybe. Does it mean that the inviscid limit holds? And this is again what Claude asked just before. Or at least maybe such abstract results are too abstract. How about this? Take that space X where Prandtl is well posed and take data for Navier-Stokes in order which is in that space X. The same data, let's say. 
can you prove the implicit limit of on, on an O of one time interval? Right, so this is a question about you give me the parental solution. The second one is a question about you give me the space in which you know I can construct the parental solution. And the answer is yes. If data, if X is the set of uh, class of analytic functions, and here I put recently my Kava. Uh, my Kava's result states that if the vorticity is zero in a neighborhood of the boundary, then you have implicit limit. Uh, the zero function is a very analytic function. So in particular, if the result uh, that Marco talked about of uh, tangential analyticity implies implicit limit, because it's only tangential analyticity, it means you can do compact support in Y, and in particular, it's a corollary, my Kava's result, because the zero function is an analytic function. But uh, what we wanted to actually ask was, do you have such types of results in the monotone in the Olenic setting? And the results are as follows. So let me first say uh, the observation, and this observation was uh, made uh, concomitantly by Jim Kelleher. The observation is there's a connection between the sign of the vorticity on the boundary and the visit limit. So let me state the theorem. Assume that there's no backflow in Euler, so that trace of Euler has one direction. There's no, you don't have this, because then you're gonna have that and it's trouble, right? So you just have that, one sign. And you assume the vorticity is positive on the boundary, which is again, the Olenic setting. Then the invisible limit holds. And uh, you can check the theorem that you don't need it to be positive. You just need it to be not much more negative than negative one over nu. So it can be very negative, but not too negative. So infinity is okay, negative infinity is not okay. Um, let me give the proof of this because it's very elementary. And again, I'm following Elena's uh, talk where she very nicely explained. You just take difference of uh, Navier, Stokes, and Euler. You write down the equation for the difference. The difference doesn't have homogeneous bo Dirichlet boundary conditions, namely the, uh, the normal direction is zero, but not the tangential one. And then you, you can, however, multiply this one by V and integrate by parts because Navier, Stokes is zero on the boundary. So this is why you can do this. You have this term for Navier Stokes times Euler, and you have a bilinear term. This bilinear term is uh, harmless because V times V, you put L2, L2, L infinity. So again, we're working in the class of smooth solutions, not weak solutions, as uh, Elena suggested. So if you have smooth solutions, then this is harmless. This will be a Gronwald type term, so this is the term you need to deal with. And uh, for that term, you try to integrate by parts, Gradient of Navier-Stokes is not zero on the boundary. And uh, therefore you do get the boundary term, which is the tangential derivative of the Navier-Stokes flow multiplied by the trace of the Euler flow. Now you remember the vorticity is D1U2 minus D2U1, so you just rewrite this. And I'm using the capital U notation for the trace of Euler. And now the observation is, is a triviality. If this is positive and this is positive, this is positive, so I can just throw this away. So the sign of the vorticity on the boundary trivially is related to the implicit limit because this other term you can just hide as long as the Navier-Stokes, as long as the Euler solution is again smooth. And then you have Gronwall. You have V squared here. This is not a Gronwall type term, but it behaves like new. So as viscosity goes to zero, you get convergence to zero. And in this term, you can also see how negative you should be able to take vorticity, right? So we threw away a term which is in fact maybe small. Instead of throwing it away because it has a sign, we could try to bound it. So how much should you pay? You should pay a one over new price, well, times something which is little o of one. And then you have the implicit limit. Now, this is the observation regarding the vorticity on the boundary. The vorticity on the boundary, it's very hard to estimate because you have, as, uh, as we saw earlier, vortex sheets and so on. So it may be more physically relevant to study the vorticity in a layer. And this is the, the main result that we have. And one can phrase this as a one-sided Cato criteria. 
and the result goes as follows. Um, as you define a boundary layer gamma sub nu as follows. So the layer gamma sub nu has width almost new. It's new with a logarithmic correction, and I'm always doing, we're always doing new times tau because the size of the layer initially can be zero. So tau is the ramp function, zero, one. So the initial layer can be, doesn't have to be there. And you pay a logarithmic price, something which is little of one. So this function m sub nu is any function whose time integral goes to zero. Okay, so it could be log, 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 log. It could be just something which is little o of one. Now, this is the definition of the layer, so it's almost a cutter layer. Um, then this is the condition. You look at the piece of the vorticity which is more negative than m over nu. So you look how much of the vorticity lies below negative m over new. Again, if it's positive infinity, that's okay. Th and then that piece, which is below this level, has to satisfy the cutoff bounds. That the time integral of the L2 norm in L1 in time should behave like new to the one half. Okay, it's the same uh, cutoff bound. So if this goes to zero, and this is where you use that m goes to zero, then the inviscid limit holds with the rate given by this m. And in that sense, we call this a one-sided cutoff bound because we still have a condition on the vorticity as, as in Kelleher's work in the, in the in a O of new layer. However, we do allow it to be positive infinity, not negative infinity. Uh, the proof is basically building up on Kato's proof by constructing, as Elena showed us, a boundary layer corrector. And we just had to tweak the corrector in a suitable way. So let me give you the proof. Um, so this is, uh, I want to start off with the corrector because this is the important part. So the corrector, you want to design it to be divergence free and it should lift the boundary condition of Euler in the interior. So the, the corrector on the boundary should be capital U. And the boundary here is again, x2 is equal to zero. So what you do is the following. So the way Kato does it, he takes a corrector so this is x2, which does something like this. And these guys are both uh, new. We're doing a different type of corrector. Our corrector has a piece which is exponentially decaying at rate one over new. But the problem with this, and that's the exponential piece here, is that it doesn't have zero mean. And that will screw you in the end. So on top of this, we need to put here a bump. But I want to emphasize that this is decaying on characteristic lengths, which are like new, and this has characteristic length one. It's away, it's in the interior, right? This bump is in the interior, whereas this has characteristic length, well, I call it alpha times tau. Alpha is a number we will choose later. Spoiler alert, alpha will be new. So that is uh, the corrector we take instead of the Kato corrector. But again, it has the same purpose of lifting the boundary condition. And once I told you what phi one is, by just using divergence free condition and uh, the boundary conditions, you can compute phi two and it's that. Okay, what are the properties of this corrector? Well, as I said, it has the right boundary conditions to exactly cancel the Euler boundary conditions. So Euler plus corrector has zero has Dirichlet boundary conditions. So in particular, Euler plus corrector plus Navier-Stokes has Dirichlet boundary conditions. It is divergence free. And it is small in some sense. In what sense? The tangential derivatives of phi one and phi one behave like alpha to a positive power. P, maybe for simplicity, just think of P as two. I stated, I think, the theorem with L2, but I want to say the proof is with P. <laughs> And then there's a power here uh, of P there. So P is two everywhere. However, the normal derivative of the corrector 
because, because of this piece, you pick up a one over alpha, and this is bad, this blows up. The second piece of the corrector is very good. It's not even root alpha, it's alpha. So whenever we will see normal uh, derivatives of the corrector, that's the terms we need to pay attention. Okay, so let's do the same. Ah, by the way, one thing. Remember we want to prove Navier Stokes minus Euler goes to zero. Instead we're gonna prove Navier Stokes minus Euler minus corrector goes to zero. But the corrector itself goes to zero if alpha tau goes to zero. So just, just to clarify that. Okay, so we're looking at V minus corrector. So Navier Stokes minus Euler minus corrector. That's the, the thing we do energy estimates on, like Kato. Okay, you write down the PDE and you do L2 estimates. You can do L2 estimates because this V minus V vanishes on the boundary, so you can integrate by parts freely. And when you do that, there's two terms, and exactly this is like in Kato's proof, and exactly what Elena showed earlier. There's a linear piece and a nonlinear piece. There's many nonlinear pieces, but just these two matter. Namely, when you take at Navier Stokes, Navier Stokes gradient of the corrector, and again, even in this piece, only one of the terms is bad. When you have D2 of phi one, that's the only bad piece. And gradient of Navier Stokes, gradient of the corrector, and as you can guess, D2 of phi one, uh, D2 Navier Stokes one is the bad guy. And you need to control these, these two terms. And I call I1, uh, we call I1 the linear piece and I2 the nonlinear piece. So let's discuss I1. And this is where our condition on the vorticity actually shows up. So recall what the vorticity is. And as I said just before, the only the term which has D2 of phi one is bad. So the rest you bulk together in I12. And I11 is the vorticity, D2 phi one and the new. So I almost also changed from uh, D2 Navier-Stokes one up to a change of sign to vorticity. This term we threw in here. Okay, so now, again, we have not so far chosen the rate of decay here, and for simplicity, let's not even choose the size of the width of the, of the layer yet, so let's call it beta. Let's call the size of the width beta, and we're gonna optimize at the end between alpha and beta. Um, okay, so gamma beta is that layer. You look at this integral, you write down exactly what it is, and by that I mean we plug in what d to phi one is. And you pick up this bad guy. Now you add and subtract your uh, barrier for the vorticity. You have one term where you look at, by the way, this is we assume always is positive. So when this plus m over nu is positive, positive times positive with negative we can throw away. This is not positive, but this one oscillates on the, it's, it's small. It oscillates here, away from the boundary. So that's okay. So the bad guy is omega plus m over nu times u. That one we need to estimate its negative part, because it's positive part we can throw away. And there you can do Cauchy-Schwarz. So you look at vorticity plus the barrier, look at the negative part, L2, in the layer. Now outside of the layer, you don't do this. You instead simply estimate. How do you estimate? You say this is less than gradient of the vorticity in L2. This you actually integrate. You do Cauchy-Schwarz and this is what you pick up. So again, in the layer, this is the dominant term. Outside of the layer, this is the dominant term. This is a term that we're gonna hide in the Navier-Stokes dissipation. This is by assumption something which goes to zero, and this is gonna go to zero. So two terms one has to optimize. The remaining terms are harmless. So you fit these all together. Oh, and by the way, the remainder terms, which on this slide were these ones, we bound exactly as in Kato. No difference whatsoever. So when you write down what you just proved, is this uh, little ODE for V minus phi. This came from the dissipation. This is a price you paid. And then you have right-hand side. Now you look at the left-hand side and you say this better not uh, 
this better help me. So you choose alpha times tau to be like the viscosity divided by a large universal constant. This universal constant, of course, related to high norms in some HS of the Euler solution. But that's a priori given. Once you have chosen what alpha is, you look at this term. So this is new, this is new now. This is something which goes to zero. So now you try to optimize the remaining terms. Namely, you try to set these two equal to each other. Alpha is like new, so these cancel. And here's where you see that beta divided by alpha, so beta divided by new, you can afford it to be logarithmic going to zero. So once you plug in these two numbers, everything here that I'm emphasizing is order capital M. That's how we chose the parameters. And capital M is something which goes to zero in the viscosity limit by assumption at any rate whatsoever. So then, of course, the corresponding Kaito criterion will be, well, as long as this also goes to zero, as the viscosity goes to zero, and here you see that alpha tau is like root nu, so there is a root nu left. In the Kaito criterion that <laughs> we saw earlier, it was nu times the L2 norm squared. Just to clarify, it is the same. <laughs> so here I'm just writing root nu times L2 norm power one. But it is exactly the same, except we're only looking at the very, very, very negative piece of the vorticity. And then you can close by a typical Gronwall inequality, and you finish the proof, and the rate of convergence of Navier-Stokes to Euler is given by that. So uh, that was the theorem, but I want to say it does have a caveat. If we go back, it would be great if we could make assumptions on initial data rather than on solutions of Navier-Stokes. This is still a theorem in the spirit of Cato, which says if the Navier-Stokes solution does something, then it converges to Euler. The initial motivation of say something about a space X in which you have data, which implies the inviscid limit, does not seem to carry over to the Euler aesthetic so far. And establishing this bound from, uh, let's say, positive vorticity data, as far as I know, is, is open. And with that, I'd like to conclude. Any questions? I have a question on your comment. I don't know if you pay attention to what I said in 